Wow, hello, thank you for having me. Um, I want to acknowledge country also, uh, here where we're gathering on the lands of the Bunwarang and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, a place that's been a gathering place a place where stories and perspectives have been shared for a very long time. But here also in the presence of this work uh, to acknowledge that in experiencing and seeing this work, we are on Bangarang country in Kaura, uh, which is close to the Victorian border on the Murray. And here in the space of this shed, as Simon mentioned, a couple of, of perspectives from me, a couple of Australian stories, a, a political one and a personal one. So firstly, a, a truncated uh, Australian politics from my own gaze at this iconic image. What does it tell us about feminism, about colonialism, about power relations? Let's look at the male gaze. Men admiring one another's bodies. These are images that today we're probably more used to seeing as stills in sports pages because we do this a great deal. Men lunging, men grabbing things, men about to score the goal, men having scored the goal. Uh, images of men at work are not images that we see typically every day anymore. And we've just heard from Michael as to why it was so important at that time for this to be, to, to be captured and, and um, Michael spoke about the risks to the, to, to the ram. Um, there's, um, if we have a look at the skillful worker in the front, I think, uh, I think his own groin's at a bit of risk there from the <laughs> ram. It's, uh, it's a very, very skillful, uh, skillful approach here. As Michael mentioned, the only figure who is looking straight at us is a mere child who is not yet implicated in, in this, um, you know, in the more, in the more dispersed, uh, uh, sexualized gaze. She's not admiring uh, the, the powerful male bodies, but she's looking straight at the artist and, and, and thereby at the viewer. Uh, again, even, even more cheekily, knowing that this has been um, a, a, a posed, a, a constructed figure. Um, it's a young girl who's, um, who seems more interested in the composition of this rural scene than in, than in what's actually happening. We would be speaking in those terms if this were a photograph. We'd be looking at that and thinking how, how wonderful he's, he's uh, managed to capture that lucky twinkle in the eye. Um, but of course, it's, it's not a lucky twinkle. Uh, the, the, the artist has taken great pains to create this composition, deliberative planning and sketching, as, as Michael was just telling us. So Roberts wants our eye to be caught by this cheerful figure. There's some strong bodies, they're holding some wriggling sheep here against the great Australian outback with its inscrutable treachery. And doesn't that sheep look very patient? The one who's about to be dragged in, you know, it's almost content to be the next in line, doesn't it? That interesting thing about colonisation, these lovely docile creatures that we've introduced to master, grab in this way. And uh, if we look at the next cheerer, his gaze isn't on the cumbersome animal that, uh, that, that he's somehow carrying aloft. You can look, its feet are, they're not even touching the ground. It's this amazing feat. You know, merinos can weigh uh, anything from 35 to 150 kilos for breeding rams, which is what these animals are. And there's more than 15 kilos, maybe 20 kilos of wool there alone. You see, these are, these are big animals, this, this heavy beast could slip from his grasp at any time. But, but, but no, his gaze is on the technique of the man before him. He's focused very intently on his hands. Hands that are somehow, again, still using manual scissors, yet leaving that plush, white, woolly flesh, unscathed, unnicked, unmarked by those characteristic red spots. This is a, this is a great craftsman. This is real talent on display here. The shed itself as a, as a place uh, is quite an evocative sort of marker now of places where we might travel around, around our regions. Um, it's become quite a, quite a touristic uh, experience as well where you can walk in and see one empty and have that sense of place and really imagine what had come before. 
my own Australian story evoked by this painting is about the, the, the memories and the histories that are evoked by the sight and the, and the smell of such a place. Uh, because it's somewhere where I've been myself and worked very hard over the years. My parents migrated to Australia in 1964. Uh, then we all moved back to Greece forever in 1980. And then we all came back. And then they moved back to Greece permanently in uh, 2010. Uh, and thankfully that's, that's, you know, that's, that's for good. Uh, and they now live on an olive grove. <laughs> Which is quite lovely. My, my father was a really highly skilled craftsman in, in wood and we've worked on many things together over the years but largely in Australia, in fact mostly in Australia, he worked in factories. Uh, his uh, English was never great, he hadn't had the opportunity. Neither of my parents uh, graduated beyond the first few years of, of primary school. It simply wasn't possible uh, in, in the Greece that they grew up in. And um, it's funny, in the early years, I look at some of the family photographs, particularly the, the years before my sister and I were born, and the, the weekend Barbies with everyone from the factories, they, they, they look like publicity shots from SBS. You know, you've got the guy in the turban and the lady in the colourful kind of sari. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it was a remarkable, uh, remarkably diverse environment in which he worked, and he was constantly coming home with stories of... Um, um, the different struggles that, that, that people have gone through to be where they are and to be lucky enough to have a hard-working factory job and to be in an environment where a good humour helped the hard work, um, to work with committed unionists, to understand the power of hard work and hard labour in driving this country and certainly for me to getting me where I am today and I'm forever grateful. My mother comes from a very long line of goat herders. And she also worked in factories in Australia. She worked in paper plate factories. She worked in factories that make frames for leather handbags. Uh, but she'd come from the open mountains where the workplace extends to the sky. You can only have a very little glimpse of sky here. Largely her work was on mountains, sleeping on mountains. Uh, goats, of course, are, um, you know, they're, they're, they're quite agile creatures, so they, so they do enjoy that. But I, I've spent, um, over the years, the equivalent of probably a good couple of years helping um, with the goats and with the property, um, probably a good couple of years across the past 25, and I've learnt a great deal about... Um, well, I guess the, the, the particular approach that, um, that, that different herders of different animals take, because you see in the village where my, where my mother comes from, it's the shepherds who are looked down upon. Goats, you see, have got some, some real smarts to them. They're quite agile. They form their own groups. They follow the leaders that they themselves have identified themselves. They climb trees. Their hair is uh, quite easily clipped without risking cuts to the skin. And their poo is perfectly soft and round and manageable. <laughs> which, is, uh, which is very important because sheep and, uh, you know, the, the, the village hierarchy, the social hierarchy, sheep are quite silly creatures. They will meander here and there. They'll follow anyone. And their poo is soft and squidgy and it's really smelly, and it stinks up the house. And the house was often, in the time when my mother grew up, where the family lived and where the animals lived. It was generally the one single structure, whether it was inside the village or a few kilometers outside the village. And so where the, uh, where the smells traveled was uh, an extremely important part of the way that people socialized. And of course, the sheep would just sort of, you know, smell a lot, wander aimlessly into cultivated pastures rather than leaping about, you know, with one another like clever goats. And no, nobody liked the sheep, really. But you certainly, certainly my line of work, I've had the occasion to reflect that you learn a lot about leadership from herding goats. <laughs> so Shearing the Ram shows us a romanticised and industrialised pastoral scene. There are production lines, there are roles, there's, there's an elder. We can't smell it, 
We can't smell the oil, the sweat, the poo. We can't sense it, the back-breaking effort, the repetitive strain, the pain. What we can see here is a perfectly composed representation of Australian working culture that was in fact already on its way out by the time this painting was, was completed, about to be replaced by a different space, the whir of the electric shears, replacing the sounds of the men's bodies and the sheep's movements, but generating an ever increasing hoard of wool to send back to Mother England. Thank you. Thank you.